language has many aspects, of course, doesn't it, Philip? And there's what I found when I was trying to inspire people with a love of literature in Oxford when I was very young, was that the process that Academe sanctioned was to take this object that was full of complexity, full of things that were not being said, but were being conveyed. Mm. Um, importantly, they were implicit and they were embodied and they were utterly unique. Yeah. And it took them and turned them into something general, explicit and disembodied and abstract. And it's this kind of unmagic trick in which, as it were, the beauty of the thing suddenly collapses and you're left with a handful yeah. of dust. Uh, so, uh, I, the, in my early days, I wrote in my 20s a book called Against Criticism, which was trying to explain why this process was, was wrong. But the, the, what you're doing, I think, when you're cleverly suggesting things to the reader but not actually saying it, is what all great poets do. There's so much in Shakespeare, isn't there, that it, you, yeah. can't, you, you look for it, you can't find it. But it is there, it's being suggested to your mind in yeah. all kinds of clever ways. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, something else came to mind as, as I was listening to you there. It's, it's, and I forgot what it was now. Um, it, it's, it's, it's to do with the business of poetry as magic. Um, mm. Collingwood, R.G. Collingwood, the philosopher, mm. um, had a phrase called disenchantment. And he was talking about the disenchantment of the world, the world which previously um, contained a sort of magic. Um, now it no longer does. I find this with poetry, and I found it very hard when training teachers, as I did for a while, to get them to do um, more with poetry than translate it into prose. Yes. They thought that once they got a poem full of these and thous and all the fashion, that sort of thing, once they got it into modern English, they'd done the poem. <laughs> but what they'd done was kill it, actually. Um, it, the, the poem was being tortured. And um, like many victims of torture, it confessed in the end, but what it confessed was worthless. <laughs> it was just, you know, uh, banal. Um, the, 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 the magic of the poetry is in the magic. It is, it, is a sort of, mm. it is a sort of bewitchment. And when they thought they were bothered and bewildered, they were being bewitched. <laughs> and um, we mustn't let that... We mustn't ignore that aspect, that dimension of poetry, because that's where the poetry... Um, really flowers and really has its effect. Where it has its being, yes. I, I like all of that very much, um, but I want to, for the audience's sake, to enter an extraordinarily important caveat, which is that nowadays when one speaks of magic, one suggests immediately deceit, mm. uh, conjuring. But actually, we're not talking about that, either oh, of us. Not at all. We're talking about a creative power that actually brings things into being. And this takes me to a topic that I think will be dear to your heart as it is to mine, which is the nature of imagination. Yes. And I, in the book, I tell a story about um, J.R.R. Tolkien, who was professor of English at Oxford and a fellow of Merton College. And the other fellows, it, academics, are an enormously sensitive, prickly, narcissistic lot. And they, <laughs> they get terribly upset if one of them gets more fame than the others. And um, all, all the fellows of Merton got thoroughly sick of guests being brought into dinner and going, Oh, Professor Tolkien, your works are so marvellous. And uh, anyway, one day somebody brought in a guest and was introduced to Tolkien and said, Oh, Professor Tolkien, your works are so, so, so full of imagination. And from behind the newspaper, a cross mathematician was heard to snort, Imagination? Imagination made it all up. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it sort of puts one's finger on the problem between two entirely contradictory meanings of imagination, that which alone can bring us into contact with certain very important, the most important things that exist, and that which deceives. And I was particularly interested in, perhaps I can mention this, 
the writings of Wordsworth and Coleridge on imagination, and they wanted to make a very important distinction between fantasy and imagination. To them, fantasy turned you away from reality and just clothed it in something prefabricated that came from somewhere else in experience. Whereas imagination was a faculty whereby you looked at something you thought you knew and was apparently familiar to you, and suddenly saw into it for the first time and realized that you had never known it at all, yeah. but that now you did. Now that is the magic that we are talking about. And if I wanted to use the word magic, I would do it very much circumscribed by this idea that it is, we're referring to a creative power that is utterly real, that is quite essential for contacting reality, mm -hmm. but is not reducible to a technique or to a fantasy, and is in no way to do with deceit. It's so interesting. Exactly, you yes. say in That's Demon Voices, the, yeah, well, that almost, almost verbatim, I think I've written it down, you say you feel a sense of dissociation when you're asked to speak at science fiction and fantasy um, yeah. conventions, because you, your work is, is stark realism, as you were saying. Well, I, I try and pretend it's stark realism, <laughs> and people don't know how to deal with that. The, the, the person who um, <laughs> really, as well as Coleridge and Wordsworth uh, was, was interested in what the imagination was and how it was, was of course William Blake, yes. um, who I think got it right when he said you, you only truly see things when you see them with the eye of imagination. Yes. Um, and what, what he meant by that I think is all the associations, the memories, the, uh, the, other, the other things you know, the other things you can see, the, the entire gestalt. Yes. And that's something which you, you're um, very emphatic about. We, yes. we need to know the whole, the whole gestalt, the whole surrounding context of something before we yes. know it fully. Yes. Uh, and to, to isolate something from it and try and um, get out of it what you yes. can get out by torturing it, doesn't work. Yes. Um, yeah, that, that generation of poets and thinkers, mm. the words with Coleridge and Blakes and so on, were really on to something. Mm. And um, we, we, we're still, um, well, I'm, I'm still sort of digesting what they, what, what they yeah, left yeah, to us. Yeah. You say that Blake was, uh, there's a book about Blake that uh, described as the god of the left hemisphere. Perhaps you could explain why. Oh, is. gosh, no. Uh, there is a book, a very good book, which I recommend to the audience by Roderick Treedy called Blake and the God of the Left Hemisphere. Oh, yeah. And what he is saying is that Blake describes the deist God, the mechanistic engineering God that he identified with Newton's concept of the universe as um, the God of the left hemisphere, the one that desires power because the point of the left hemisphere is to help us manipulate the world, to grasp things, controls the right hand with which we do the grasping, the getting, the putting together for our own use. And it, so he was talking about that aspect of the divine as something negative. But Blake had the deepest intuitive sense, so marvelously expressed in his poetry, of something far beyond that, that he you know, that couldn't be reduced to such a formula at all. And he was making that very distinction, in, in a way, between the world, and, in, and that includes God, as conceived, um, putting it very much in shorthand, by the left hemisphere's way of approaching the world by serial processing, analysis into parts, and so forth, and the way of the right hemisphere's take, which is gestalt-wise. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this term, uh, I can demystify it. We don't have a proper word in English, but um, it's a very important word in psychology. The gestalt is a whole that cannot be reduced to its parts, that when you take it apart, you've lost the whole, which is true of pretty much everything, actually. Because the world is composed of gestalt and of one kind or another, and certainly great art is mm. like that. So, you know, the, this way of seeing things is absolutely, let me stress this, absolutely core to good science as well. In case there are people saying, well, yes, it's all very well, it's airy, fairy stuff coming from people who spent too much time with poets. They didn't really understand what the world's made of. It's made of stuff, and Newton had it all worked out. Well, actually, of course, modern physics tells us that it's all much more complicated than that, and that our minds help 
uh, influence what there is in the cosmos. But when you read, as I have done in preparing this book, the stories of many of the great scientists and great mathematicians, how they reached their discoveries. At some stage, there was some very hard sequential workaday work. But when the discoveries came, they came through the imagination, which saw a connection, a shape, which hadn't been seen before. Very much like, in fact, what Philip is talking about. And so for real science to make steps forward, for maths to make discoveries, requires a sense of beauty and a sense of form. I mean, it's so extraordinary when you listen to mathematicians describing how they were guided, and physicists, how they were guided to an amazing insight that we now accept is correct. Very often, they, they point to explicitly a sense of beauty in it. So there is no war between science and the arts. This is another mistake, like the idea that philosophy and science should be separated. We need to get out of our silos. We need to have universities where, as it were, there's discussion between these de departments and not just a superficial conversation, but a real mutual understanding. I was going to say, what, what you, when you talk about things that the way of understanding them is, is sort of formless before we've given them names, you, you talk in the book about Wordsworth, as you were just saying, and how he describes the sort of optimum time when he was young, mm. before anything had been, yes. and everything was alive for him, and you, and you quote um, from the Ode on in, in, uh, Intimations of Immortality from Recollections of Early Childhood, this wonderful time when everything was new, everything was exciting, yes. uh, inarticulable. Yes. Yes. So is, um, from both of you, this, this sense that the time, the optimum time of thinking and seeing the world is, is through a childlike mind, and it, you, that comes into... Well, what? yeah, there was a time when Meadow Grove and Stream, the exactly. earth, every common sight, yeah. made it seem... I thought one yeah, of you yeah, might yeah, quote it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I love that poem. It's a, it's a wonderful description of the way that we grow up, and it's, it's, um... Do you want to, do you, do you want to, um, do, say the poem, to read the poem to the There was a time when I mean, it's like, the glory and the freshness of a dream. <laughs> it is not now, as if, and so on, it goes on. Yes. Um, I, I can and also the shades, shades of the prison house close about the growing about boy, the, the process house. of yes. losing yes. this insight. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's something that I was very interested in as a stage in our development as human beings. In, uh, the, in his Dark Materials, I wrote about the time when, uh, with the coming of puberty, um, it often coincides with a, 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 a change in our intellectual apprehension of the world and um, a loss of innocence, a loss of... And I saw this when I was teaching children of this age who, when they came to the school, were young and primary school age children, and they could dance and they could draw pictures without any self-consciousness. But as they grew, um, suddenly they became self-conscious. Or not suddenly, but gradually they became self-conscious. I can't draw as well as him. And she's much better at that. And they, they became sort of enclosed. All sorts of things were happening to them. Their bodies were changing shape, their voices were changing all sorts of emotions were going on and the sort of turmoil. Um, it's a great time of change and that's what I was um, writing about in his Dark Materials. It's a very interesting stage in our human development um, and the question is what we do with it. Um, do we welcome it? Do we nurture it when we see it in other people? Do we say, oh, you'll go through this, don't worry, it's all going to go. It's, um, it's it happens to all of us, and it, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's been better described, actually, than in an essay by the German romantic writer Heinrich von Kleist, in an essay which he called On the Marionette Theatre, which deals with this loss of, in Blake's terms, innocence, this coming of experience, this time when we lose a sort of um, sense of jointness with the world, when we feel we feel isolated from it. Um, it's, it's something that you either have to live with or go through or come to terms with or something. Because we're not the same after it. And this is, this is what I was writing about at the end of um, His Dark Materials, when Lyra loses the power to see, to understand this instrument that she's had, the alethiometer. She can't read it anymore. She's lost the power to do that. But there is another way, which is by learning, by intellectual graft, by hard work. In, in Kleist's terms, he describes a dancer. 
um, who is free of self-consciousness, wonderfully um, free in all her movements and so on. Uh, but that's because she has learned consciously to do the things that previously she did unconsciously. Now, this isn't something that I can relate very closely to left hemisphere, right hemisphere thing, but it's something that it interests me greatly because um, it does, it, it, it's what Wordsworth was talking about with Shades of the Prison House. Mm -hmm. It's what Blake was talking about in, the, in, in, in Innocence Changing to Experience. Um, and I wonder, Ian, how does this, um, what's, what's going on? <laughs> when, Can I add what's going yes, on and how do when, we when, overcome when, it? How do we carry on to see well, like that? Well, there are two questions there. I mean, what's going on and how do we overcome it? And what's going on, I think, is really not the most striking difference between the left and right hemisphere, but possibly the most important one. And that only dawns on people after, after a while. It's the distinction between presence and representation. Uh -huh, yes. Now, we are so used to already pre-digesting everything in our experience, already having an image, a symbol, a map, a diagram, a theory, that we find it very hard to remain with the actual experience as whatever it is is coming into being for us. What Heidegger called presencing, uh, it, it was a neologism in German, Anwesen, uh, to use Anwesen as a verb, and we have adopted in English presencing, which means that through one's awareness of something, something comes more into being for us. And I think mindfulness is one of the ways in which, in a very simple way, we, we are trying to teach ourselves again to just be present, rather than already have gone off into our mind into a representation. But mindfulness aside, this is extraordinarily important because I think what Wordsworth is pointing to is that when you are young, things are fresh and you are really experiencing them and you're really open to them. You're not already substituting your theory of reality, your map of reality for the reality that is being mapped. But we, as we grow older, find this very hard to avoid. And I think actually also the modern the contemporary world in which we live does this to the greatest extent that has possibly historically ever existed. To the extent that now I think a lot of people find it very difficult to tell the difference between a theory and experience of the mm. reality. Um, a couple of friends have stories about um, driving and navigating and one of them says, well the sat nav says we're there. And the driver looks at them and says, I don't think we are. We're supposed to be at Penge <laughs> Sub Post Office, but we're somewhere on the South Downs. Well, the sat nav says that yeah. we're there, so we <laughs> must be there. Uh, you know, this is the, where we are. But so presencing and representation, this is the big difference in the right hemisphere to which things are fresh and new, and once we think, oh, it's one of those, it's stale, I've got it, I've got it, a can pigeonhole it, put it in a category, it literally, you can see on imaging that the processing moves towards the left hemisphere. Mm. So that is a distinction. What we do about it, I don't know. I mean, although being aware, I mean, I'm a great believer as a psychiatrist that the first thing in getting anyone to change is making them aware of what's going wrong at the moment, what they're doing wrong, otherwise they won't know what to do. But there is something important about what Philip said, I think, about the dancer. And it's in Clyde's ending that although one loses that fluency, it can be recaptured later after the innocence has been lost. Yeah. And this is like the, a very important idea to me that there is wisdom, the other side of foolishness. And there is knowledge, the other side of ignorance. And there is innocence, the other side of experience. So there's the innocence of a child, and there's the innocence of a saint. And these, one is earned through long suffering, and it's probably a richer thing than was lost, if you see what mm. I mean.